So I don't know how well you remember grade 11 chemistry. How come we're drawing loose diagrams where things are breaking the octet rule? I thought you said that the octet rule was a, a rule. Oh, will you stop asking questions? Yeah. Oh, uh, so yeah, sure. You look like you remember it pretty well. What we want to do today is talk about quantum theory and bonding and take our currently accepted model the atom and use it to figure out how we explain bonding and see if we can do a better job of answering those questions because the problem with it last year was that we didn't have a theory that could explain those weird instances in bonding. So let's remind ourselves what a chemical bond is in the Bohr theory. And it was an overlap of orbits. And we used to draw things like this even a couple of years ago in, in like grade nine or grade 10 even, where you said a covalent bond was the overlap of orbits. Electrons were shared and that was a bond and in most cases that was a molecule. And we had to get a little bit messy in certain things uh, like say double bonds or so on and then we couldn't really explain multiple, uh, sorry, uh, uh, breaking the octet rule very well. But if we look at quantum theory and we remind ourselves of some of the fundamentals of it, we're now not talking about orbits as much as orbitals. So we can still talk about a bond as being an overlap, but now it's an overlap of orbitals. But then an orbital, remember, is not a physical thing. It's not a pathway the electrons follow. What it is is just an area where we are likely to find an electron. So how does that change as we form bonds? And then the other thing that's going to be kind of important for this and the other thing that's going to take us a while to get through is this notion that an atomic orbital how an atom exists is not necessarily going to be the same thing as what is used or how the molecule exists. So we'll talk about atomic orbitals, we're also going to talk about molecular orbitals. And we're not going to get too deep into it, which is good because it's already going to take us about four days to get through the things that we do need to do. If I look at this picture here and I say that the uh, green lobes represent one of the p orbitals, the yellow lobe represents another p orbital, and then on an alt, uh, a, a a molecule, sorry, on an atom uh, somewhere else or right beside it or overlapping with it, I suppose, is an s orbital. I can say that that is a bond. Uh, now, I have to qualify a couple things. Number one is I'm missing one of the p orbitals, assuming it's being used, but there's a p orbital that comes directly out of the screen toward you and directly behind the board uh, behind me. There's also um, if I'm now talking about an electron being shared between those two atoms, there is also this notion that where I'm likely to find the electron has now shifted because I'm likely going to find the electron between the two nuclei and not on that far lobe or in that far lobe on the alternate side. Okay, so let's look at a couple of fairly simple molecules, ones that we already know what they look like. We're going to look at hydrogen and we're going to look at water. So if I take hydrogen and I represent the, the atoms using the orbital box diagrams, how I represent um, orbitals with electrons in them, then I notice that each one has a single electron. I can line them up, I can overlap them, and then I can say that that is where the bond is formed. And I know the sharp minds among you are thinking, wait a second, both those electrons are pointing the same way, shouldn't we? And yeah, I know, we're not really going to worry about that too much, making sure that the spins are paired up. We're going to assume that that happens when the electrons uh, pair up in a bond. We're not really going to get too worked up about drawing it that way. In the case of water, H2O, two hydrogens and one oxygen, I'm going to line the hydrogens up where the single electrons and oxygen are, and I'm going to uh, overlap those orbitals and say that there are two bonds. So I can use the stuff I have already to represent the bonding in fairly simple molecules. I also need to uh, pause here and if we go back and think about the stable octet, and yes, we're going we're gonna to move our, our understanding forward, I hope, because um, our old understanding of octet was just flat out simply eight electrons in the outer orbit. Whereas now we're going to adjust that a little bit and say that a stable octet can be thought of as a full S and P set of orbitals. So if I look here at the oxygen, full S, and then it started out with a partially, mostly full P set of orbitals, but then overlapping with those two hydrogens, uh, gaining those two electrons or sharing those two electrons now gives me a stable octet or the full set of S and P orbitals. We may have to 
tweak that a bit more later on, but we're not going to worry about it too much. Um, the octet is no longer really our um, end all and be all that it used to be. Okay, we do run into a couple of problems. We're going to try and solve these problems over the next few days as we go through uh, uh, try and more try to go through a more complete understanding of um, molecular orbitals, bonding, and um, molecular geometry. Basically, what it comes down to. The one thing is that atomic orbitals. Um, I, oh, atomic p orbitals. There we are. Can't even read my own writing. Atomic p orbitals, they are at 90 degrees to each other. So there's one p orbital that is straight up and down. There's another p orbital that's completely left and right. And as I mentioned, the one that I left out is completely coming out of the screen toward you and back into the uh, board behind me. They're all at 90 degrees to each other, which is fine, except for what we already observe in hydrogen, sorry, in water, where the, uh, the hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen bond angle is not 90 degrees, it's 104.5. By the way, you do not need to know that number other than the fact that we can't explain that with our current understanding. So if I were to draw it, that's what I would want to draw. Now, there is the, the idea that, that what I was pointing at earlier about how those, um, what do you want to call them, the, the opposite lobes of the what used to be a P orbital, that's going to change quite a bit. And so that becomes our next problem that we have to deal with. What does the orbital become? Because it's fine to say that atomic orbitals are not the same thing as molecular orbitals, but then what are molecular orbitals? So we can say that the, the electron is very, very unlikely to be in those opposite lobes, so then I can adjust it a little bit. Now you can also perhaps say that, well now, if the electrons in those bonds are repelling each other, I, I kind of have a bit of room to move around a little bit, so maybe that's where I get the 104 uh, and a half degrees. The other thing that we have to deal with, and we'll deal with that uh, in the next few days, is what do I do with these non-bonding electrons? So one of the last steps in drawing Lewis diagrams is to put any extra electrons on the central atom. So the central atom may end up with a bunch of electrons that are not involved in bonding. So oxygen has two pairs of electrons that are not bonding. Uh, where are those electrons going to go and how are they going to influence the whole whole thing? So that's going to be another question that we have to, to answer. Um, and then, yeah, so how do they fit into the whole mix? And then the other thing is what we were talking about earlier, the octet rule. So if I draw sulfur tetrafluoride, I end up with sulfur having four bonds, so that all by itself would have made a great octet, but it ends up with these two extra electrons. Not that they're extra electrons, but it ends up with these two electrons on some central atom, clearly breaking the octet rule. It now has 10 electrons around it. What do I do with those? But I'm more interested in right now is how can I possibly explain that? Uh, does it happen to other elements? Does it happen to all elements? And the answer in order is yes, it can happen to other elements, uh, and no, it doesn't happen to all. So well, well, then what? And if I start with the electron configuration for sulfur, it is analogous to oxygen, two electrons in the s orbital, four electrons, hopefully that says four electrons in the uh, p orbital. If I draw out the orbital box diagrams, I end up with this. So very, very much like the oxygen. But the thing that I'm not including is this allowed, so possible, but not currently being used, um, d orbitals. And again, orbitals are not really a thing, they're just where am I likely to find an electron. So these orbitals for sulfur are possible, but they're not currently being used. If I start using them, now I can start moving electrons around a little bit, and maybe I've got more than just four uh, pairs of electrons around the central atom, and that's it. Right? So maybe I can break the octet rule when I start incorporating uh, d orbitals. Okay, to wrap it up for today, uh, hopefully I wasn't going too fast, so I was trying to keep it short by talking faster. Mm, doesn't really make sense. Um, this is just an introduction to try and reset our brain and our understanding of quantum uh, sorry, understanding of, of bonding and reminding ourselves a little bit about how quantum works and some of the things that are involved in it. So really, for moving forward, the next thing we're going to be doing is Lewis diagrams. So we're going to get a couple of chances to, to check our, our how well we remember it and a couple of chances to uh, refresh our memory as we need to. After that, we will hopefully see you in class and we'll talk to you another time.